Good evening, friends on Facebook, and I'll say Shabbat Shalom. Peaceful Sabbath to you, and uh, we're in John chapter 20, and I, what I said to you guys, I'm going to say to these folks on Facebook too, because I swept a bunch of dust today, and so I'm a little bit choky, but so if I start coughing and stuff, it's not because I have a virus or whatever. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back. Last week we, you know, I, I just, I don't know why, I just wanted to get into chapter 20. I guess I just wanted to get into chapter 20, so I read those, you know, first two verses and then we closed. <laughs> I'll read them again because it, it flows into, of course. Um, chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, early on the first day of the week, and I explained, you know, the uh, you know, Sabbath, you know, when Sabbath is over on Saturday night, you know, that's that's when the first day of the week begins. Early, <coughs> excuse me. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Miriam from Magdala went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she came running to Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter, and the other Talmud, the other disciple, the one Yeshua loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. And, you know, last week I just simply explained first day of the week stuff, but, you know, and while it was still dark, so, you know, likely, you know, maybe 4.30 in the morning, or probably before 5, and that's my thing. So, let's go on into, uh, so I, I, just, I just needed to Read that again, I guess. So we'll look at, uh, we'll talk about verses three through nine, and I'll read that now. Then Kepha and the other Talmud started for the tomb. They both ran, but the other Talmud, and you know John here, he always calls himself the other guy, the one that, you know, that was loved, and so on and so forth. They both ran, but the other Talmud outran Kepha and reached the term, the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen burial sheets lying there, but did not go in. Then, following him, Shimon Kepha arrived, entered the tomb, and saw the burial sheets lying there. Also the cloth that had been wrapped around the head, um, lying not with the sheets, but in a separate place and still folded up. Then the other Talmud, who had arrived at the tomb first, <laughs> also went in. He saw and he trusted. They had not yet come to understand that the Tanakh teaches the Tanakh, the scripture, scripture being Old Testament, teaches that the Messiah has to rise from the dead. So, um, if there's any thoughts that you have, I don't mind hearing them. In fact, I like it. But knowing that I should read my comments first, and then you can go ahead and give me your thoughts that I like to hear. Uh, I only have a couple of paragraphs or so on this nine verses, and I just call it a race as well as a hesitation. <laughs> you know, because, well, we just read it. Burial cloths at the time, you know, first century time period, consisted of a shroud wrapped somewhat tightly around the body as well as a head cloth, a separate head cloth. The body of Elazar or Lazarus, was also wrapped so that Yeshua had to say, unwrap him and let him go, quote unquote. That is, these wrappings didn't simply come undone and fall off. They, you know, they wrapped around and so forth. They didn't come unwrapped just because you're laying there. So the author of this gospel, this gospel writing, and he outran Kepha or Peter, but it was Pete who went on into the tomb and found the, clo the clothes emptied, as it were, and lying neatly in place. When John went in, it says he saw and he trusted. So, you know, I mean, you, you can picture this. You, you, you go to a funeral, you know, and the body is laying there, you know, clothes on, buttoned up and so forth. But you go to the funeral and the body's not there. The clothes are sitting there nice and neat as if, you know, somebody stole the body and then buttoned them back up or something. You know, it would, 
because you'd say, okay, somebody pulled a pretty good trick here. You know, somebody was able to get in here and steal a body and not even no one know it. You know, it would, uh, if you're in her place, you'd kind of freak out a bit. Well, you know, seeing as, you know, all evidence points to, you know, tomb being desecrated and all that, you know, you're not, not a great, you know, feeling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's very cool, Mm-hmm. That prequel said that. <laughs> At this time, of course, the probably the most powerful Jewish sect, if you want to call it that, politically speaking, in charge of the temple and whatnot, were the Sadducees, mm-hmm. who did not believe that the you know. Resurrection rising from the dead, that kind of thing. So that presumably would be what was taught commonly in the synagogue and the temple and places like I guess this is before synagogue, but you know what I mean. It would have been commonly taught to the Jewish population with the authority of the temple that resurrection from the dead is not a thing. Mm-hmm. So, possibly, even though Jesus, you know, indicated or kind of led you to believe that he would come, you know, he would be buried and rise on the third day, they wouldn't maybe have seriously considered that in a literal sense, maybe. But that, so naturally, the first thought would be. Oh, somebody took the body. Right. Um, Because the option of resurrection probably wouldn't cross their Mm -hmm. mind. And that may be, uh, in this story, in all the Gospels, one of those points that's a little bit left out or a little bit missed, Mm -hmm. that he's, not only is he resurrected, which is obviously the main thing, but that he just overturned one of the major doctrinal beliefs of the political force in power. Mm-hmm. He just upended mm-hmm. in, uh, the authorities. Right. In another way. Mm-hmm. You, yet another way. <laughs> yeah. And that's, thank you for bringing that up. It's important because, you know, the Sadducees, i.e. the the priesthood, Um, they, like you pointed out, even scripture will say they didn't believe, particularly in the prophets. They would say they believed in Torah, but they didn't. So even within, outside of Torah, within stuff that you might say, well, maybe that's not a prophetic book, like say 1st and 2nd Kings, Elijah raises somebody from the dead and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not going to believe that. And so, and they, yes, were temple teachers, Sadducees, the uh, Pharisees, i.e. were the pastors of the day, and they came much closer, especially the house of Hillel, to believe in scripture. But there's a reason why all these gospel writers hammer the resurrection as it appears, you know, like everything's nice and neat, but yet he's not there and so forth, you know, Mm -hmm. that. In other words, it was supernatural. And so they, they really want to show that force so that they, because they know there's going to be some Sadducees reading their writings, at least one or two. So it is important. And the third day, remember that they also believe that you had to, you know, if you're, you're past three days, then you know that that body was absolutely dead rather than say maybe in a coma for a bit or something like that. Because... You know, they, they would wait three days to be sure. Really, really sleepy. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's a reason. The re, there's a reason for pointing that out as well, that he was in the grave for three days. So that, you know, by all accounts, by all teaching, you know, you've got to believe this because it, it we really made sure that you understand that all of these details did happen. So forth. Well, thank you for pointing it out again. Anything else?
second paragraph here real quick. <clears throat> Scripture teaches, though perhaps not in an in-your-face way, that Messiah has to rise from the dead in such places as Isaiah chapter 53, 9 through 12, and Psalm 16, 10, the latter being applied to Yeshua in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 33, by Pete, and in Acts chapter 13, 33 through 35, by Paul. They both quote from these passages. That is, a good and thorough student of Scripture, um, a good and thorough student of Scripture would have a good clue the Messiah was to raise rise from the dead. Yochanan, or John, gives great detail here from the race as well as hesitancy and the remembrance of Scripture that brought trust or faith concerning our Savior's resurrection. You know, it, there's the reason why they point out that, well, they saw this and, you know, they, did, they just put two and two together, compared Scripture and so forth, and came to believe that he had indeed risen from the dead just within the moments there because they really did believe the Bible. So any other thoughts? I was pointing out to somebody today, you know, because of quote unquote holidays coming up and so forth. And, and I was pointing out, you know, where these things originate and yada, yada. And, and, and I was saying, you know, it was, Rome, who, you know, did away with the Sabbath for Sunday, did away with, you know, Passover for Easter, did away with this and this, you know, trying to make us more Roman rather than biblical. And I said, so, you know, we'll talk a lot about the Reformation. We, no one will mention the Counter-Reformation, which shut the Reformation down. Hence, we still do what they did prior to the Reformation. <laughs> but... Tradition will always outweigh the Bible until our Lord comes back. But same with the Sadducees of the day. Tradition outweighed the Bible because that's the way tradition is. It's very heavy and you can't, you can't scoot outside of the way people are, you know, and actually stick out. We once upon a time call it being a Protestant. Oh, don't, don't say that word anymore. <laughs> we protest nothing. But anyway, I'm, I'm just pointing out that, yes, Scripture says he'll rise again. He rose again. There's detail given. And you can trust and believe, as Pete and John did. Okay. Even if it doesn't seem traditional. Uh, John chapter 20, 10 through 18. Sir Tao. Can I get you to read those fairly close to 20 verses? 10 through 18? 10 through 18. That's nine verses. Oh, nine. Pardon me. <laughs> I, was, I had 18 in my mind. So we're at John after 20. 20. 20. Verse 10. 10. After nine. Before 11. <laughs> Twelve all the right up. And twelve is the right up. <laughs> but it's all the way to eighteen. Right. Not nineteen. <laughs> Are you sure? <clears throat> this this you know, ten feels like the whatever. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she looked in, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Okay. If there are no questions or thoughts concerning, I will read paragraphs, and then you can talk. Yeah. Simple, simply uh, put some heading on these three paragraphs. The heading being the original gardener and top rabbi. The original gardener and top rabbi. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, you know. An angel, quote unquote, or messenger. Um, we say angel. Otherwise, messenger. May very well appear to be, you know, any ordinary human being. Hence, she didn't, you know. And of course... You know, scripture's going to pick on her being a her, a she. And so, you know, she needs she needs a, an angel to to really confront her and so forth. But I'm not trying to <laughs> be sexist here. No, I'm not a sexist. All this sort of thing. In fact, such may, ha may not have any absolute need of being supernatural or spiritual or have such an appearance. A messenger, an angel doesn't have to have wings or, I don't know, doesn't have to be whatever traditional thing you might think of. Thus, Miriam, her Mary, believes these two beings are likely gardeners. Even as she asks them where they have drug Yeshua's body off to, she does not realize that her Savior is standing right there until he calls her by name. And for what it's worth, Miriam, from an Egyptian standpoint, means beloved. In Hebrew, this, this name combines bitterness, mara, or drop, mar, with yam, or sea, <laughs> Miriam. I take her name to mean drop of the sea. He not only knows us quite well, but our given names. By our given names, he also gives each of us a name that perfectly fits each person uniquely. Now, her name means something like a drop of the sea, like a tear of the sea. But he can give her a name that is very uniquely and specifically something that defines her like nothing else can. And so it is with each of us. Thus, when he calls her by name, she turns around. Miriam also calls Yeshua by a rather special title, Rabbani, or in King James, Rabboni. It's something like my great one, and I'll say Aramaic, of course, that's Hebrew. The name is a Hebrew name. It means my great one, as in rabbi, and you know, rabbi, my, my rav, my, you know, high, you know, great guy, or Rabboni, just all the more emphasis on my great person. Such a title was conferred only on the heads of Central Academy, or the Sanhedrin. Paul's rabbi, Gamaliel, was otherwise known as Rabban Gamaliel. Though we do not know that Yeshua was ever ordained as a rabbi, we know that he was regarded as one by his followers. We can find that in Matthew 23. That is, the word first came to be used as a way of honoring a person whom one looked up to as his or her teacher. It otherwise came to be a matter of ordination later on. Even in the first century, it was a matter of ordination. Then it wasn't for a long time during the Dark Ages. And now it is again. But like... like uh, um, what do we call him? Um, I won't think of it right now. A very well-known rabbi about a thousand years ago. But because he was in the Dark Ages, you know, everybody would call him rabbi. It was Because it was the Dark Ages, he was not ordained. But that didn't mean anything. So you don't have to be ordained for somebody to simply call you a, a title that means, hey, I, I really like you. 
So it otherwise comes to be a matter of ordination later on. Even my mom would refer to her mother-in-law by the Spanish word moy, which has a very similar meaning of rav or rabbi in Hebrew. And I remember one time, she, I, I, I was with her all most of the time when she'd come to my grandma's house, and she just naturally called her moy. And one time she looked up at her and said, why do I call you moy? You know, because I donned her on her. That's a quite a thing to say, you know. But it's it's equal to the Hebrew word rav or rab, rab, rabbi. So, but it's just a tradition, you know, somebody that you respect. Yeshua tells Miriam to stop holding on to him, or King James says, don't touch me. Not because of some fragility of his post-resurrected body or something of that sort, but because he still had high priestly duties to fulfill. He was about to go into the Holy of Holies, you see, as it were, go to heaven. And, <laughs> you know, if you, if you were to meet a high priest on his way of to the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, well, you're, you're not even in the tabernacle or temple. You would be outside of it altogether. You, you wouldn't be in it at all. So you would not be grabbing him on the way to the Holy of Holies. Very similar to this. He, it's not because, don't touch me, I'm, I'm, I'm a two, whatever. It's, hey, I've got, I still got this, I'm still on this mission of death and resurrection here. So as for Miriam, seeming, catching the understanding, she runs to find the Talmudim, the disciples, to give them the good news, or as we say, the gospel. Any thoughts concerning? I'm I'm just repeating what Scripture says here, but explaining words that you already know about. Okay. So she gets rather excited, coming to understand that Noah's body wasn't stolen. Um, this is too freaky for me to, well, I guess really be freaked out for probably a split instance, but then come to understand, hey, you know, yeah, I remember him saying this would happen. Okay. My dear is, yeah. Um, Sir Brian. Yes. Could I ask you, well, I'm, I'm asking you, so uh, I'm going to ask you <laughs> to read John chapter 19, or 20, pardon me, John chapter 20, Verses 19 through 23. Okay. Thanks. In the evening that same day, the first day of the week, when the Talmudim were gathered together behind locked doors out of fear of the Judeans, Yeshua came, stood in the middle, and said, Shalom, I like him. Having greeted them, he showed them his hands and his side. The Talmudim were overjoyed to see the Lord. Shalom, Alakim. I can't say that word. I don't know how, to say it. <laughs> how is it said? Shalom, Alakim. Alakim. All right. Yeah. I don't know that I've never. It sounded like you were saying, it's, I like him. And so yeah. I was laughing at what, <laughs> what you said earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 yeah. It's a song that actually we used to sing. Okay. Shalom, Alakim. All right. So, Shalom, Alakim. <laughs> Yeshua repeated, just as the Father sent me, I myself am also sending you. Having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Ruach HaKodesh. If you forgive someone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you hold them, they are held. Okay. My very simple heading is Shalom Alekim. Receive the Ruach HaKodesh. Shalom Peace to you, receive the Holy Spirit. And on Sunday evening, okay, so it's been pretty much a 24 hour period, give or take. Or not 24, you know, pro okay, let's go ahead and say an eight or eight to ten hour period. We'll just say about that. Depending on depending on when, you know. Yeah, so I guess, you know, the you know, if the next day. Like, it's kind of, you know, like, you know, 
evening, but before the sundown. Right. And so it still could be as much as twelve hours, depending. Yeah. But we'll say maybe it's seven point. o'clock. I don't know. You know, some somewhere in there, and we said you know maybe somewhere between four and five when they came to the tomb. It says it was still dark. But anyway, um, so on Sunday evening, the Talmudim were hiding out for fear of the leadership who brought Yeshua to the Roman government, government, fearing that they would do the same to his followers, who, yes, were also Jews. So, you know, it was, we would call it anti-Semitism. Rome was not well pleased with the fact that there were Jews that they had to govern. <laughs> and so... They were hiding out because they just put their leader to death and so forth. Yeshua decided to show up right in the middle of them and say Shalom Aleichem, this rather common greeting from someone who was quite dead only a day ago. This common greeting appears to bring the otherwise supernatural into the normal. Because he says it twice. He just, you know, through this yeah, passage well, here. Yeah, just, you know, be like, you know, walking and, you know, it's like you're, Friends are having a you know, solemn get together, hide out, whatever, and you know you who they think are dead walk in the room. And it's like, what's up, dudes? Yeah, and it's like, hey guys, what's up? Yeah, it's, it's basically like that. Like just <laughs> exactly. He just and he says it twice. You know, he says, hey, hey, how you doing? You know, that sort of thing. And so, it's, long time no see. Yeah, it kind of brings all of a sudden the way the way John writes this. He's <laughs> he's kind of making it like, hey man, you know, yeah, it's supernatural, but hey. You know, that, that's God. You know, that's, his, that's his way. That's, he's accustomed to that. He is supernatural. <coughs> it's natural for him to be supernatural. Supernatural. So, Actually, still supernatural? No. Uh, yeah, supernatural meaning basically yeah. beyond nature. Repeating the greeting, he speaks of a commission and then breathes on them, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. Spirit, breath. Wind, all the same word in Hebrew, maybe Greek too. I don't know. I'm not a Greek dude, but what's same. the Greek word for face mask? <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting to know. Huh? <laughs> so he he breathes on them, and that's his part. Then he says, "Hey, receive that, okay." <laughs> You know, I receive the Holy Spirit. This immediately takes me back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God breathed the breath of life into Adam. At least in that sense, this act, as recorded here in John's Gospel writing, seems to have something of a recreation in mind. There's something of, well, redemption, recreation. A new beginning. So it's not like he never, the Holy Spirit didn't exist until now. Just that there were dry times in history and it got all the drier. You know, the prophets rant about this continually, but it just got all the drier. And so he said, hey, uh, I'm going to breathe on you, but it's up to you to receive this. Of course, this will become more fully filled about a month and a half down the calendar road. What, you know, what's called Shavuot, or we commonly know it by the Greek name Pentecost. It is the person of the Holy Spirit of our God, living and breathing in us that gives us the power to do such otherwise strong and even unauthorized things as forgive the sins of others. You won't find in scripture, i.e. the Old Testament, uh, the command to forgive the sins of others. Only God forgives sins. But if he puts his Holy Spirit in you, he is in you, therefore, he authorizes you to forgive the sins of others. It is this presence, capital P, presence, the person in you, that differentiates us from mere animals and causes us to more to be more actual humans. How can we truly function all that well without him? You know, for the common person out there, 
they are a human being. Maybe they don't realize that they're not an animal. Animals don't, well, they might try to act like human beings when they become pets, but they don't, they don't sit down and write a book. <laughs> they, you know, so even the common human being who may not know much about himself or try to dream up something about himself has the image of God within him or her. How much more when God breathes his very breath into us, we receive it. Do we become more like him, able to do the things that he does, even forgive sins? We think of supernatural things as, you know, raising some somebody from the dead, which, yes, is scriptural. But here he's saying, forgive sins. But he's also saying, if you hold them, they are held. Mm -hmm. So how does that reconcile with the, you know, forgive 70 times 7? Mm -hmm. He's not saying, he's not saying don't forgive anybody. He's saying you actually have the authority that you use, you have the choice of how you use that authority. I'm not saying you should not forgive sins. I'm just saying you have the authority to the point of saying, I'm not going to forgive and it won't be forgiven because he gives us his authority. It's not a, yeah, that's a nice thing to say. No, he gives, if he's breathed into you, his spirit, you have his authority. So just use it wisely. Use it wisely. Forgive sin. They, they have the choice to receive that forgiveness. You know, it frees us. It frees me if I forgive. If, you know, Brian beat me up <laughs> just out of the blue, not because I needed it, but just because he thought I was ugly, which I am, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Evening. So, so, and I forgave him. That frees me. Whether he receives that or not is his matter. But it frees me. So. I understand that point and how it frees the person who chooses to forgive others, that it frees them of the burden of that. You're not carrying that. But this verse, mm -hmm. Where did I put that? Oh. it is about your authority mm -hmm. to yes, forgive. But I'm trying to put it. People came to Jesus and walked away without asking for forgiveness or without choosing. They chose not to follow him. I'm thinking rich and ruler here. Jesus could not forgive him or or did not forgive him because that person didn't ask for it. That mm -hmm. person didn't accept who Jesus was and the forgiveness Jesus offers. And so those sins were not forgiven. And so if the authority of Christ is in us, that same authority applies. If a person doesn't come to us and say, forgive me, or, you know, I'm going to follow Jesus and ask for that same mercy, then you have one of two choices. It seems to me. You can do what Jesus did on the cross and say, forgive them for they don't know what they did. Or you could allow them to walk away. Like Jesus did with the rich young ruler. He mm -hmm. allowed that man to walk away unforgiven. So, I mean, is that is that a wrong interpretation of that verse? No, or? It's, it's not. I, it's, okay, on one hand, you're free. You did what you could. On the other hand, it's one of the hardest things that you can do. We've experienced this. I don't know any human beings 
past, I don't know, 20 who's not experienced this. But this is called respecting the major thing being created in God's image does. It gives you a free will. Mm -hmm. Now, we may not understand free will. It's beside the point. There's a lot of things I don't understand. Doesn't mean they don't exist. We each have a free will. It's exhibited each day in our lives. We may not count it as such, but you choose to wake up. You choose to eat breakfast. You choose all kinds of stuff. You can also choose to not receive forgiveness. You can choose not to receive him as savior. You can choose all those things and you will. You will make those choices. That's very hard for someone, even in our Lord's case. As he offers himself to somebody and they say, no, thank you. But he's going to respect that because he created that person in his image as his likeness. And if that person doesn't want him, doesn't want that likeness, well, okay. You know, that's it's one of the hardest things to, so not turning away you, or turning away, oh, goodness, freedom, <laughs> so many things, you know, but, so it is a very tough thing, but it's also an honorable thing to say, okay, I can honor your decision to say no to me. See, yeah, and I agree with you. And I think verse 21 may be getting forgotten here a little mm -hmm. bit. It says, Yeshua repeated, just as the Father sent me, I myself am also sending you. Right. We forget that Jesus was sent with specific a mission instructions. He was mm -hmm. supposed to do these things during this period and he followed that. He had authority to do more mm -hmm. but he was under the Father with very specific instructions. Right. You can do this stuff here but it's not yet time for you to do this stuff. In the same way that he said, may this cup pass from me but not my will, but yours be done. Right. Mm -hmm. In the same way, he could ask that the Father forgive those that are putting him on the cross because they don't understand what they're doing. But he did not say, your sins are forgiven. So whether or not those Roman soldiers actually asked for forgiveness or not, and there's some reason to believe maybe, you know, there's apocryphal stories not at least one of the guards. But anyway, um, <clears throat> the point is, this is the same book where we find John 3.16. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, whosoever believes him. So it doesn't say for God so loved part of the world that he, he sent his son only to that part of the world that he wanted to save. Mm -hmm. He said, for God so loved the world, everyone, but only those whosoever believe in him, Jesus, would be saved. So like you were saying, it's their choice. And in the same way that Jesus was in this way underneath the Father, because I'm sure Jesus would have been even more free to with his forgiveness than he already was mm -hmm. if that didn't all also violate you know the nature of God mm -hmm. quite frankly um, because he came to die for the whole world not mm -hmm. just only for the ones that accepted him but only right. the ones that accept him well good these people who Jesus is commissioning here are similarly restricted if they have the power to forgive or withhold forgiveness, it's only within the limits that Jesus could do the same thing, which means free will. 
must be respected. Mm -hmm. And so if they are acting in cooperation in accordance to the Father's plan with the Holy Spirit in, in them and dwelling in them, then just like Jesus could forgive sins, and he did explicitly, which really hacked off the Pharisees uh, a few times, they could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So just because they have the authority doesn't mean they can just willy-nilly go around and decide who and who isn't getting saved. It still has to be consistent with the mandate from the Father, just like Jesus was subject to that mandate here. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I might try and answer that, if that makes any sense. I don't know if it made any sense. It makes sense. And I, I it's, it's, <coughs> I think I'm. I don't know if it answered your. No, uh, yeah, I understand what you guys are saying, and I agree with what you're saying. But I think there's something in there also because you have Jesus, what well, on the cross, he forgave people that did not ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. He specifically interceded for people who were choosing to rebel and reject him, and so that's. You know, that was his choice in, in mercy to intercede for those people and actually, you know, ask God who is Jesus of them mm. to forgive them. And were, so, were they actually forgiven? That was my question. Do we know that? Or was he just asking in the same way that he asked the cup to be passed from him so that he didn't have to be crucified? He was expressing desire, but that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that's what the plan was. Mm -hmm. So I yeah, and, and I guess that's why I used the word intercession. He's yeah. interceding for these people to be forgiven, but that in order for it to be effective <laughs> and salvation, right? You know, a part of salvation. Yes, their free will had to agree with it, right? Yeah. But even if they did not, even if they still rejected Jesus still wanted him dead. God could have chosen at Jesus' request to not lay it at their feet. There may there may be 5,000 other sins that they're guilty of and, mm -hmm. That's true. you know, going to have a just judgment placed on them for those sins, but not this one. Yeah. So I, in, in that, in that vein, if we do carry the authority of Christ, we also have the authority to intercede for someone to be forgiven. But we also have the authority to not make that intercession and allow that person to be handed over to the enemy. Yeah. Because that's what Jesus did. He right. would allow you know the rich young ruler to be handed over. In order to bring them, hopefully, to a salvation experience. But yeah, I think that's what I'm trying. Yeah, that's it. It's a very fine point of authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very specific sin he's picking out. He's not saying yeah. of all of their sins, just this thing <laughs> that you did. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. ask God not to lay this at your feet. And I, I believe God would honor that prayer. And I believe He would honor our prayer. If we ask for specific sins that are, and, and it doesn't, I want to make sure that clear as well that this is not about a sin against us individually, us personally, like an offense or, I mean, even a brutal sin perpetrated on us as the individual, but just a sin that leads to death for that person. We carry the authority of Christ to either intercede for that to be forgiven or the authority to let them carry that mm -hmm. sin's punishment, hopefully in order to save them. Right. And what you're talking about here is, and it goes back to where, where our Lord is getting his statement, Father, forgive them. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. They what they're doing. Goes back to Leviticus chapters four and five, where it says nine times, gives nine different instances. They could have given 140 
nine instances. But it's just given somewhat random instances where somebody sins in ignorance. It'll, it'll repeat that nine times. If somebody sins by doing this in ignorance, it doesn't count against them. Mm-hmm. But when they realize that that was wrong, then they come to the Lord, mm-hmm. you know, via the priest at the time in the temple. But that is, you know, that's what he's saying from the cross. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they're sinning. So forgive them. It's not held against them. But if you go to Leviticus 4 and 5, the rest of the story is, you know, you're also basically praying that they will come to understand, oh, that was wrong. You know, and mm-hmm. actually it's called conviction. Yeah. You know, conviction rises in you to where you actually understand deep in that what you did back there that you were naive about was actually wrong. It was actually harmful. It was actually not healthy. And you thus are compelled to come to the Lord about that. So, yeah, in in the case of holding forgiveness because they don't have a clue what they're doing, then the option is pray that they will discover that is very unhealthy. It's sinful. It brings death. It, you know, like you pointed out, brings death even in stages and so forth. So that is also respecting their will to wake up to, you know, what they did was all those things. But you're basically, that's when you talk to the Lord to say, hey, uh, you know, forgive them because they don't have a clue, but may they someday have a clue. The sooner the better. Well, and and Jesus breathing on them and then receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what informs you as to which route you need to take. Mm-hmm. If you're listening carefully. Yeah. We can know scripture. You know, John will say, Sin is lawlessness, or that is literally translated sin is that which is against Torah. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Torah means to hit the mark, or Torah means to hit the mark. Sin means to miss the mark. So there you go. We can know that intellectually and follow. But the Holy Spirit comes and really alivens, and alivens our spirits, our intellect, and our bodily processes so that we are even inspired to know scripture deep within our spirits, not merely intellectually, so that, and thus people as well. So we can discern where a person is in their life and say, boy, they're just not ready for that. They're not really ready to know that, you know, they're sinning, they're doing that sin, which is against the book, scripture. And, you know, like I said earlier, we live life by tradition, and tradition will always trump the Bible until our Lord comes back. Well, that's otherwise called sin. <laughs> but we're ignorant of that. And discerning that folks are ignorant of that, they're not going to be able to receive that. You could tell them 10 times. If it's not going to seep in, it's not going to seep in. But if the Holy Spirit convicts your spirit, as well as your mind, by breathing into you, so we, we think we're filled with the Holy Spirit by jumping up and down. You're filled by the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden you start understanding this book. Because it was the book was written by the Holy Spirit. So we can pray that folks would receive the Holy Spirit inside of them to the point of understanding. I did something against this book. Oh, my. This is God's word. This is his breath. So I need to, I need to follow up and receive that correction and be free. (laughs) Very good. Something else I thought about separate Mm -hmm. is if Jesus said, I'm sending you as the Father sent me, And what did they do to Jesus? Because the Father sent him. We just read about it. 
Jesus preached the gospel about himself boldly and fearlessly, but also cleverly and subtly in times just, you know, he didn't fall into the um, traps that were set by various people. And they killed him for it. And he's telling them, you do likewise, mm -hmm. and the world is going to hate you like it hated me. Right. He says that. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, ooh, you get all the magical powers. Mm -hmm. You also get all of the consequences of the world hating you mm -hmm. that's a term and wanting to kill you. And it's their possibility. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And several of them, by tradition, did get killed for mm -hmm. preaching the word. So, and if, he's asking us to do the same. If your living out the Bible knocks somebody's tradition, they're not going to like you. Mm -hmm. Experience, okay? Lots of it. I was up for about two hours last night thinking of how we used to actually use the word Protestant to mean what it actually means. Nowadays, politically, we would call ourselves, rather than Protestant, libertarian. Basically means more or less the same thing. Nowadays, we just think, we don't even think of Protestant anymore. <laughs> but we just, we would somewhere in the back of our theological minds, well, because I'm part of this denomination, I'm a Protestant. No, you're not. It's a very practical word, has practical meaning, and that involves your lifestyle. If you are doing the Bible, even though tradition says to do this, and everybody and their dog does that, even though they don't know it's mere tradition, but you're going to do the Bible instead, that's called Protestant, and they will not like you. Mm -hmm. And that's what our Lord experienced, intentionally experienced. He was doing the Bible, not man's tradition. He even pointed that out a few times. And I'm just picking on tradition. You do something that is not commonly done from the Bible. And even if folks agree with that, if it's not commonly done, they're not going to like you. Okay. What folks like, think of the word like. It means you're alike, you know. <laughs> you like people that are like you. That's what the word like means. But if you're not alike, if you're not within the realm of somebody else, they probably won't, you know, by definition, like you. And the Lord is saying, hey, just as I was sent, in the way that I was sent, I am sending you. You know. Some folks are going to like you because you feed them. That's popular with anybody. They're not going to like you. It's popular with Yeah, it's popular with even pets. But when you do something that is outside of tradition or outside of something that's not, you know, it's just not commonly done, then you're going to be called, weird will be the nicest thing you'll be called. Uh, just, just know that. Anything else? Uh, hmm. yeah, I like this bit. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and do a little bit more. Because you like this bit. Yeah, yeah, I like this bit. John chapter 20, 24 through 29, Sir Adrian, if I could ask you to read that, John 20, 24 through 29, that would make me happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 24 through 29. Mm -hmm. Jesus and Toma. <laughs> <laughs> now, Toma was the name. Tom. Toma. Thomas. The name means twin. One to a was not with them when she came. When the other Talmudian told him, we have seen the Lord, he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger into the place where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I refuse to believe it. 
A week later, his Tom and Dean were once more in the room, and this time, Tama was with him. Although the doors were locked, <laughs> um, Yeshua came, stood among them, and said, Shalom Aleichem. Then he said to Toma, Put your fingers here, look at my hands, and take your hand and put it to my side. Don't be lacking in trust, but have trust. Toma answered him, My Lord and my God. Yeshua said to him, Have you trusted because you have seen me? How blessed are those who do not see but trust anyway. Thank you. Yeah, to me, this is has always been a powerful passage. So I'll give my you know three or four paragraph note, and you can I will invite you to chime in because I like your chimes. Uh, the infamous doubting Thomas. As we know, the name Toma, or Latinized as Thomas, means twin. But because of this particular passage of Holy Writ, the above title also became his nickname. Kind of funny how your actual name become a nickname as well. Kind of like when I play with the name Ron and spell it as W-R-O-N-G. So I tell people I always spell my name wrong. This may well be why the writer feels, feels to the need to point out the meaning of this name. Toma refuses, it says, to believe in Yeshua's resurrection unless he has very viable truth, proof, pardon me. And, you know, I can, I can respect that. So I wasn't there. You know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, they'll talk about this political figure or that political figure that the news is going to make sure we know everything about. And I'll tell them, I've never met that guy. I've never met that person. Yeah, I can hear people, other people talk about him, but I, I personally was not there. And so I can respect Mr. Toma or Thomas saying, hey, I wasn't there. I like you all, good friends, but I wasn't there. So until I personally experience what you've experienced, I'm not going to believe. The Talmudim get back together eight days, a week later. It appears in such places as Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, 2, that Saturday nights became the meeting or congregational time for early believers. Uh, before Rome demanded the change of the day, day of the sun, in 395 AD, the Council of Laodicea, that is. As we know, a male child is also circumcised on the eighth day after birth. So this is kind of a special day. Once again, the doors were locked. Again, for some time, the, basically until Shavuot or Pentecost, the believers, the followers were intimidated, to say the least. They were scared. So again, the doors were locked. And uh, even so, Yeshua said, it says, he came and stood among them. <laughs> he doesn't, you know. Hey, I'm going to come on in. Doors locked. Oh, well. Um, with that same familiar greeting, he then focused on Mr. Twin, telling him to do exactly what Toma had said that he absolutely must do in order to believe. So, OK, if you if you've got to experience this, then hey, do it. We are not even told if Thomas actually stuck his hands or fingers into our Savior's side. What we do know is Thomas' declaration my Lord and my God. Now I fully capitalize Lord here, L-O-R-D, all caps, because the Greek word kurios covers yod heh vav -Heh throughout scripture within the Septuagint. So Thomas is basically setting the standard for the rest of the New Testament and calling him yod heh vav -Heh, calling him kurios, calling him all caps Lord as well as my God. Not just God, but my God. Again, Thomas, I can respect, not because he's doubting Thomas, but because he said, hey, I respect you guys, but I've got to experience this myself. This is a very personal thing. But when it becomes personal, he says, hey, you're it. Yeah, I mean, this is. So now I've, 
fully capitalize this. I fully, you know, want to make sure that we understand. Thus, Thomas also calls Yeshua my God within the same breath. Yeshua, ten, Yeshua then says, how blessed are those who do not see, but trust anyway. Have any of us seen him? Have any of us put our hands into his side and so forth? No. But he's saying, how blessed are those who believe even though they don't do what Thomas said he needed to do. Verses 28 through 31 will set up a set up a summer a summary, set up and summarize the purpose of Yokanan's gospel presentation. That is, Thomas' exclamation should not be taken lightly. John, as he writes this, he ends chapter 20 by giving us the reason why he wrote it. But just before he gives us the reason for his writing, he gives Thomas here, saying, this has got to be personal for me. And so I'm going to read this. Next week we'll go into it, but in the presence of the Talmudim, this is verse 30, in the presence of the disciples, Yeshua performed many other miracles, which have not been written, recorded in this book. But these, which have been recorded, are here, so that you may trust that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by this trust you may have life because of who he is. And he gives, just before he says that, this account about Thomas making it very personal, or he will have nothing to do with it. It's basically what Thomas is saying. I don't care if you guys believe or not. I appreciate you guys believing. But for me, this is a personal thing. And then John says, this, by the way, this is why I'm writing. So I think we all here understand that. Well, I think it, it, speaks to how much Jesus loved him mm -hmm. that he would he was sure he was very specific to do the thing that Thomas needed mm -hmm. without judging him for it right? but to do the thing that he specifically needed so that he could believe yeah he didn't he didn't judge him condemn him or anything because he understood Thomas Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that John presents is how he he goes to each person individually and knows what they individually need. Mm -hmm. So he knew that Thomas needed to have that personal experience. So he said, hey, first thing out of his mouth, hey, go ahead, do that thing that you said you needed to do. You know, go ahead and make it personal. And in a way, he says that to each of us. I mean, goodness, why would he say I'm going to give you a name that no one else knows? Just me and you. It's called very personal relationship. So, you know, I respect family. I respect us all gathering. But at the same time, I respect personal relationship. You know, and that means I can respect your uniqueness, every, each person's uniqueness. And say, I can appreciate that and I value that. That's why I ask for your input. Because of your relationship with him. Okay, I'm, I'm. I don't have to preach that among us here. Um, when you know we're we're gearing up for uh, doing Hanukkah, and it's going to be based off of Isaiah sixty-two, the first few verses, and um, what what you said about the you know the new name thing. Uh, verse I'm going to read one and two because two kind of depends on one for Zion's sake I will not be silent for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her vindication shines out brightly and her salvation like a blazing torch the nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory then you will be called by a new name which Adonai himself mm -hmm. will pronounce right Yep, and he's always been like, he doesn't change. There is no shadow of changing in him. Mm -hmm. Same yesterday, today, forever, he stands outside of time, not affected by it. 
which means he, <laughs> there's no reason for him to change. So he has always wanted that very special individual relationship with each one. So, okay, very good. Yeah, I'll go ahead and pray because feeling that one. Heavenly, <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you again for, well, thank you for Shabbat, for Sabbath, and just a time to be with you, with friends. <laughs> and Jack. And Jack. Thank you for, uh, thank you for friends Baby. and family and a wonderful little girl. And thank you for making it so certain that we understand that you really do desire a very personal relationship with us. You honor that. And may we, I understand nicknames and stuff, but Father, may we look at Thomas in a unique way just as our Lord did not condemn him, did not make fun of him, did not do any of those things, may we also come to understand that this is good stuff. I trust that you'll give each person here a good evening and a good Sabbath tomorrow. And thank you for Jack, who's happy. And uh, <laughs> for a wonderful little girl. And Bashim Bishu in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi. <laughs> Smiley. Okay. And when we say hit that like button, and we're talking about YouTube too. That's no. <laughs> Scholar Ministries YouTube page. Been around since what, 2016? Okay, sorry. Long time. Long time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>